Well, here's a new story for you. Here is the first installment of Emily Bronze, The Sins of Another. I hope you enjoy. Hope you enjoy the music. Found this guy on YouTube. Uh, he does it for, for free, believe it or not. So I might shoot him a bit of money here in a bit. It's pretty good music. But yeah, hope you all enjoy. The Sins of Another, Prologue, The Tide Rise. The Midwest of America was never deemed an especially glamorous place to live, being mostly the home of the devout and the freedom-loving. Sometimes living in the Midwest had some issues, such as trying to find fresh fish that didn't come out of a pond or river. But Emily Bronze was never happier to be surrounded by wheat fields and deer. Emily was a short woman, her hair as red as it could come, and sported enough freckles that it was possible to trace Godzilla on her if someone had enough imagination and guts to do it. Her eyes were what her mother called the perfect green and those who worked with her at the coffee shop always said that they shone like emeralds, no matter the time of day. It was this kind of talk that had pushed her to take theater in college and pursue an arts degree, something that ended up being a very expensive hobby, when she realized that the pool for actors was as thin as the pool for marine biologists and deep-sea divers. Actually, she was pretty sure that there was a better chance of being a deep-sea diver than ever seeing her green eyes staring back at her from up high on the silver screen. Thankfully, she had a backup plan that entailed posing with weapons and guns for people online, something that kept her apartment lights on and something other than ramen noodles in her pantry. She didn't mind doing it, as she didn't even have to get naked, and found something appealing to getting paid for lounging in her pajamas while juggling three different pistols at once during live streams. The downside was that her apartment constantly stank of gun oil and steel, a small price to pay for fame and glory. This was, of course, all in the past. No one was really sure what happened or what caused it to begin with. Hell, Emily didn't even know what happened for days afterwards since she was stuck in the work loop, pumping back-to-back -back shifts making lattes to afford the newest BREN 805 rifle. And I'm pretty sure I said that wrong. If I did, I'm sorry. I, I don't know guns. It was the one drawback to her old gig, having to constantly stay up to date with the latest trends. Ironic, since she missed the biggest trend of them all. A thunderclap was heard around the world, originating from the Gulf of Mexico and shattering the windows of any building that was along the coastline of all the American landmasses. A few hours later, during the chaos, the oceans rose sharply and began drowning everything for hundreds of miles inland. Whole portions of states and countries were swallowed under an uncaring assault of salt water, and the entire planet lost hundreds of thousands of miles of dry land. Of course, Emily didn't really notice. She was tucked away in the relative safety of Wyoming's mountains, and she didn't even hear the sound of a thunderclap around her noise-canceling headphones while sleeping the morning away on her day off. She was so used to ignoring the chatter of customers that on her shift the day after the thunderclap, she didn't even pick up the alarming tones of residents freaking out over the sudden loss of the entire state of Louisiana and Texas being so far underwater that Dallas and Houston could only be found by flying around and trying to spot the highways or tall business buildings. As Emily and her fellow Terrans would soon find out, it was only the beginning of something bigger, an event of such colossal scale that it would not only change their world, but the worlds of many. Emily finally caught on to what was happening after her fans let her know some of the strange things that were happening around the world, putting it upon themselves to pull the curtain back for our dear old Emily. She must be incredibly dense. Who sleeps with noise-canceling headphones? How loud does it have to be in your community to have to sleep with noise-canceling headphones? Anyway, around Earth, things began to appear. Doorways and buildings that once led to closets or simple warehouses now became interdimensional doorways to worlds beyond mere mortal comprehension. Worlds of unknown and alien wonders, peoples and races only found in storybooks, and things so awful and twisted that merely looking upon them with the naked eye would catapult the viewer into pure madness. From one thunderclap came many, and it began to become clear to some of the smarter humans on Earth that for some reason, dimensions were colliding with each other at such aggressive speeds that it was as if they were made of putty and being mashed together by a child. These dimensions were never meant to mingle, never meant to ever touch, but now they are being crushed together by some mysterious force. The laws of these planes and Earths began to try and come to some sort of agreement, despite being strong-armed and having to be right on top of each other, giving way 
to all of them sharing the same place in space and it's constantly warping back and forth. One day, someone would be shopping for socks and picking up a gallon of milk and at the same moment find themselves in the middle of a castle while still holding their shopping trolley. This, of course, caused some major issues, as now the oceans of Earth were now a swarm with creatures of Goliath natures, the coasts were teeming with unknown creatures of shadow, while the rest of the countries had to deal with all manner of folk simply walking out of doorways and trying to pay for hot dogs with solid gold coins. The Earth was now what could be called an anchor for all the dimensions. Apparently, all the planes deciding the inventions of soda and chocolate bars outweighed such trivial things as magic and limitless knowledge of science beyond the mind. The humans of Earth, now simply known as their space moniker of Terrans due to another plane being known as Earth, and not wanting to cause a fuss with the Fey people, would have preferred to have a word in the discussion about it, as now they were playing host to all manner of strange people. Those who wanted to stay on Terra after a plane shift had just to walk out of wherever it was they appeared, and voila, Terran for good and Terran for life. That doesn't sound like a very good immigration policy. Oh well. Humans, of course, adopted the strange beings into their big weird family rather quickly, and the companies that ran merchandise for the world found no issues with creating new lines of products for these strange beings bearing gold and platinum coins. I can see why. Emily herself was getting some new weird neighbors, mostly being the Fey peoples. For some reason, the Fey fell in love with the Midwest due to its more nature-centered terrain. And now you could find goblins sipping on caribou coffee, or centaurs happily sucking down veggie smoothies from Whole Foods. Ew. Emily almost had a scare when she met her first goblin and by cult <laughs> by cult what what does that mean <laughs> And by cult, they really did fit the bill when it came to the stereotypes. The only thing that caught her off guard was that all of them having smooth French accents and sharing the same love of beverages as humans. Everything started out in quite a friendly way, all the races mingling and learning about each other, but this was only happening in the Midwest, really. On the new coasts of Terra, something more sinister was at work, and soon the stories began flooding from all around. Massive beasts that roamed buildings and plucked anyone they could find like ripe fruit. Things that gurgled and boiled in the night, people disappearing in droves from major cities, or altered so horrifically that they barely looked like they could pass the bill as a living creature. This plague was wrought not just on the humans, but all the creatures who got too close to these beings. It took no time at all for zones to suddenly appear and become places common with battle and skirmishes. The Fey peoples had never come into contact with the shadow beasts of madness, and not even the Unseelie had any idea what they could even be, or what else could be lurking below the waves. One thing was agreed upon, that there was something hiding below the waves, probably coming after the largest of the thunderclaps and the sudden rise in the waves. The United States and Canada, seeking a consolidation of power, quickly formed a new coalition, with the friendly Fey peoples and other dimensional beings that decided to stick around for longer than lunch, birthing the United Dimensions of North America, or UDNA for short. For the most part, the creatures of the sea and the shadows stuck to anywhere the salt water could touch, and everyone else had drawn back into the center of the land masses for safety. Emily noticed that despite all the chaos and weirdness, not much has changed over the next few months. Clientele certainly gained a couple new faces, but things seemed to chug on as normal. Commerce slowed down horrifically due to no one being able to sail ships on the sea without heavy security, or a way into land, so flight took over a lot of the back and forth trading. There was a bit of a kerfuffle when the C-17 Globemaster carrying a load of coffee beans almost pasted a Chinese dragon overnight hauling cakes for a wedding. But there- What?! An airliner nearly took down a Chinese dragon! Okay. <laughs> Just gonna run with that. Okay, where- I lost my place in all the cakes were with- But it w <clears throat> But that was rapidly fixed by quick-thinking Terrans who invented wearable radar displays for those of the mystical that weren't cargo jets. Things tracked along as normal, except for the ocean fish shortage. So what was the big hullabaloo? What was the big thing that would be the monkey wrench in everyone's gears? The thing that would finally drag Emily Bronze away from the comfort of her online gig and coffee shop? Well, that would be the demand of magic, of course. The beings of shadow? Yeah, they weren't all that happy with their favorite prey being so far inland, so far away from their comfort of sea and salt water. They had to think of a way that would bring those tasty meaty morsels to them. But there was such a bait that not even the elves of Montana could resist. When the dimensions collided, certain things went missing from all of the realms. Magic from the Fae, the Shadow Realm's ability to stave off death, and the Human Realm's low real estate prices. While this must be a world of magic if there was low real estate prices. Despite losing their ability to be eerily unkillable, the Shadow Beings did however find a way to not only harvest magic, but find and entrap magical artifacts onto the Terran realm. 
How they did this was not known, and they certainly weren't moving their many mouths to tell. But what began to crop up caught the attention of those around the UDNA. Rings that could purify water, crowns that allowed anyone to speak to animals, and some precious heirlooms that the courts of Fae deemed lost forever. As one would believe, the Fae did love them some magic, and being without its comfort for a few months really did a number on their psyche. Yes, of course, there were some who could still draw magic from unsavory places or knew a thing or two about the darker arts, but the majority of low-level fey really wanted to wield the old powers and the ones they grew up with and knew like the back of their hand. There was also the insatiable human greed of wanting their own taste of magic, being able to do what was once only wives' tales and bedtime stories, and the mere risk of death was but a small price to pay for being able to fling fireballs into your barbecue grill. Like hunters baiting their quarry, the creatures of the shadow sprinkled their ill-gotten gains as far as they could get, stacking the trail towards the she- the, the she- towards the she- I'm becoming Sean Connery. <laughs> stacking the trail towards the sea with even greater treasures, luring their prey deeper and deeper into their grasps. What use does a hungering shadow have for magic rings anyway, when there are delicious things that will walk right into their claws to get them? Chapter 1. I Quit. Emily cracked her back as she leaned against the coffee shop counter, groaning out loud as she did. She'd just gotten done doing a huge drive through order for a family of centaurs, and she was beginning to think that they were starting to replace their need for water with caribou coffee at this point. She blinked a few times and looked out into the sitting area of the coffee shop, smiling wryly as she did. The place had really changed over just a few short months, and it was still such a wild sight to her. Goblins and humans arguing over Overwatch characters, elves discussing the quality of the soil with the dwarves, and in the corner, a human middle schooler trying to understand the complex mathematics that her gnome tutor was trying to explain to her. A few times already, she had some of her more special customers explain that they were all shocked at how fast humans seem to bond with anything that breathes. And Emily was always quick to point out that humans named their Roomba vacuum cleaners or even held birthdays for their houseplants. She was working the shift alone, again, as her fellow co-worker Hog has fallen ill, again. She was pretty sure he had fallen in love with a vampire and the lack of blood in his stupid fat head kept making him miss his alarm clock in the morning. She rested her cheeks on her hands and blew the hair out of her face, looking down at the fake marble countertop. She had to do another stream tonight to help pay off her increased rent, and the comments from the goblins was really starting to make the gig unfun. She looked up and saw the back of a newspaper that a tiefling was reading, and she narrowed her eyes to make out the words. New artifact found that turns gold into lead, estimated to be worth thousands. Emily opened her mouth and exhaled roughly, rubbing her eyes with her palms. The amount of money being made right now treasure diving was really starting to dwarf her own coffee shop salary, and not even the streaming was making a dent now, with rents always going up due to demand. Even the stupid trinkets that just untied someone's boots were making big money, and they were just being picked off the ground while camping at this point. The death count was, of course, high, and the threat of being some stupid Shoggoth's lunch was always on the back of her mind. But damn it, was the money good right now? She stood up after a beep was heard from the drive through window, and she looked down into the monitor to see a female centaur pawing at the ground while looking at the menu. Emily snorted, seeing that the centaur wore the latest equine Uggs and yoga rump pants, and knew that her order was going to be before she even opened her mouth. Emily didn't mind, though. It was always fun watching their long, horsey ears twitch when the radio came on. She leaned down and clicked on the mic, watching the centaur's face on the screen. Large carrot cake latte? The centaur tilted her head, then smiled, clapping her hands together happily. With an extra shot, please! Emily chuckled and put the order in before toggling the mic back on. That'll be $5.69, ma'am. Clop on up to the window. She heard a muffled nice from somewhere in the shop, but did her best to ignore it, knowing it's a game from a goblin due to the accent. She heard the centaur's Uggs clicked on the road as she turned and began to make the latte, plugging the milk under the screeching and gurgling steamer. While the milk heated, she thought to herself, she could totally do the whole treasure hunting thing. She didn't even have to go down south where it was hot. She could just go west into Washington or a little more north to bop around Canada and Alaska. There was even treasure being found around the Great Lakes, which was still closer to home than the Gulf of Mexico or even California. She swirled the milk a bit to see how foamed it was, then turned off the steam, giving the spigot a quick wipe with a damp rag. While she got the espresso going, she began to run through the gear she already had in her head. She had a rucksack, plenty of ammunition, lots of rice, rifles to choose from, and a lot of her fans had sent her survival gear for her birthdays. What an odd gift. 
She could probably just leave and start right away, maybe just pop on down to the Great Salt Lake to get her toes wet, as some things were even being found down there, too. Dropping the shots into the cup, she pumped in the carrot cake flavoring syrup and then poured the milk over the rest of it, giving the foam a little sprinkle of cinnamon at the end. After plopping on the lid, she opened the window while double-checking the order on the screen. Emily started out in her cheerful customer service tone, but when she turned her head to look out the window, her voice slowly drawled away. Five dollars and sixty-nine. Staring back at her was the ample chest of a centaur, and Emily eyed them as if they were suspicious packages. There was a problem lately with a lot of the centaurs giving her sweaty boob money, and she was frankly tired of the whole thing, wondering why they didn't just wear a damn fanny pack. Ma'am, I hope your bills are in a pocket, Emily said, tapping her fingers on the small window counter. Oh no, they're right here. The centaur chirped and delved into her deep cleavage. Ah, for fuck's sake, Emily muttered. After a few seconds of digging, the centaur pulled out a soaking wet ten-dollar bill and handed it to Emily through the window. Emily, not wanting to touch any more boob sweat today or put on gloves, grabbed a pair of ice tongs that were gracefully nearby and took the money. The centaur leaned down and smiled happily at Emily, her great tail swishing back and forth. Go ahead and keep two bucks for yourself. It was cool that you already knew my order. Emily was biting back the urge to call her a basic daft draft when she leaned down to smile at her, but quickly turned around the thought when the centaur was so eager to tip her. Thank you. Here's your change in your coffee. Try to keep these ones dry, eh? Nope, laughed the centaur and promptly poked the fresh bills back down into her flesh canyon. As she trotted away, Emily leaned out the window and watched her go, eyebrows knit together in thought. Why on earth do they even need those things that big, she muttered, then ducked her head back inside the window. As she cleared away the order, she noticed it was only a few more minutes till she was off. Then the late night shift would take over when the unseely fay came out to play. Due to them not liking sunlight, a lot of the businesses in Casper expanded their shifts to take up the slack of this whole new market, with many of them simply going to 24 hours. As Emily cleaned up and quickly restocked the empty milk jugs, she heard the employee door open and saw her manager, Tim, walk out. Tim was an overweight man and looked like someone you would pull out of a box labeled Managers, free to a good home, jostling in the cardboard box of the rest of his half-balding littermates. I think I like this girl. Tim was the kind of guy that still wished he was in high school and was only doing this job because he didn't really have the gumption to do much else. She could tell in the way he walked he was bringing her bad news. Buzz, bu buzzly. Biz, I can read. Today I cannot, apparently. <clears throat> busily texting away on his phone as he strode towards her, his burly mustache twitching angrily. Oh, forgive me, I'm not very good at doing boy voices. Emily, bad news. Going to need you to work Al shift. Christine got her hands stuck in her garbage disposal trying to fish out her earring. What? Emily gasped and slapped the half-empty milk jug onto the counter. I opened this morning. I've been here since 6 a.m. working alone, Tim. What the hell? Emily's composure was starting to unravel quite rapidly as her hair began to fray in her rising anger and her green eyes glowing with indignation. Tim just twitched his mustache again. Look, kid, I know it sucks, but that's the way it is. I need you to stay until at least 3 a.m. when Rajesh is done with his night classes. What about the rest of the schmucks that work here? Emily growled, and now those drinking in the sitting areas were listening on to the growing volume of the argument. They said they weren't available. Tim, I need to eat, and I have a stream tonight. I can't work a whole nother shift. Sorry, Emily. Them's the breaks, Tim said with a shrug and popped a tic-tac into his mouth. Emily could feel the anger crawling up her neck like burning snakes, and her face was getting hot and sweaty. Beads of anger were coursing down her well-toned back and soaking into the waistband of her underwear. TMI. Already worn thin patients being shredded down to the quick. She was tired, she was cranky, and she had been working the shift alone for the entire day with not a single heartbeat of rest. Tim, I have been here all day, all alone, dealing with asshole goblins who have been trying to guess what color my bra is and pixies who have been second-guessing the amount of vanilla pumps I put into their macchiatos. I am tired. I am hungry. I am going home. Emily took off her apron and pulled it over her head while walking past Tim. If she rushed home, she could have enough time to bolt down some food before her stream, and then maybe she could, Emily, if you walk out of here, you're fired. Emily's sneakers squeaked to a halt on the tile floor as Tim spoke, and those who were listening all, oh quietly behind their books or papers. A pair of sprites muttered to each other just at hearing level, remarking on how Tim was being an asshole. Emily raised a hand and pointed at them in acknowledgement, at which they finger-gunned right back at her. The two Terrans stood with their backs to each other, waiting for the move that the other would make. 
Emily breathed in deep. This job didn't pay enough on its own, and her streaming was barely helping break even due to costs going up. She was tired of constantly smelling like coffee, always being let down by her co-workers, being treated like a goat turd despite the amount of work she did, and how her co-workers always seemed to get away with everything despite her requests for days off always getting denied. Emily slowly balled her hands into fists and raised her chin slightly, staring ahead at the employee exit door. Fuck you, Tim. I quit. Also, she turned and tossed her apron onto the counter beside a bank of blenders. You could pass for a centaur with those man titties. <laughs> <laughs> was the joke a bit of a tasteless low blow? Probably. But she was angry and wanted her anger to be known. Rightly so. She wanted to treat someone else like shit for once, and Tim was a prime target as any. The sitting room erupted with laughter as Tim spun around to yell at Emily, his face red with embarrassment. But Emily had already pushed past the swing door into the back, not even slowing her stride as she grabbed her satchel bag. She pushed past the employee exit and came out into the cool early evening air, her face adorned with a small smile. Her 96 Honda Shadow sat in the parking lot waiting for her, and she straddled it standing at square and kicking back the rest stand. As she slipped on her helmet, she began to wonder where to begin. Should she set off on her own? Find a company to get on with? She heard there were smaller companies around Casper that had areas that her workers delved in. Maybe she could sign with one of them. The Honda's V2 engine purred to life as she turned over the starter, and she kicked away, rolling the cruiser backwards. When she had enough room, she towed the shifter into first gear and rolled back the throttle, getting the perfect smooth clutch release she always aimed for. Tonight, she would go home and do her last stream. Maybe she could even stream on the road. A few of the more well-known treasure hunters did it, but they were all dudes. She may be able to break into that niche market as the first female Delve streamer. It was certainly better than grinding coffee beans and getting dicked over by her co-workers. That was for certain. She got home to her little apartment, she broke out the last of her bottle of wine, and fished out her last frozen pizza, tossing it into the oven while using her teeth to pop the cork on her Moscato. She glugged- is that how you say it? M-O-S-C-A-T-O? Moscato? I'm gonna say it that way. She glugged a mouthful of it while kicking off her shoes, then pulled out her favorite pair of bargain bin pajamas, a matching bottom and top ensemble with dancing bunny rabbits holding grenades in their mouth. With her pizza cooking, she got her stream running and began to tell them of her grand plan. Much to her surprise, her followers were super pumped to hear she was heading out on the treasure diving path, as many of them knew how much money was being made doing it. Of course, a lot of them were afraid of her being dragged into the murk by one of the shadow beings, but the thought of Emily doing manly things, such as fighting monsters made up of nothing but madness and nightmares, did excite them to some degree. Donations poured in from her more generous patrons, and as she blew on the slice of her pizza, a very peculiar text donation came in. It wasn't fancy, just $20, but the text portion was nothing but an address of a place located in Logan, Utah. Her fans were all over it, and their eager internet searching was pulling up a small company that dealt with the exact processes and jobs that she was looking to do. Emily wrote down the address on a pad of paper and asked a few times on the stream for the donator to message her. But no message ever came. Emily was puzzled by the unneeded mystery of it all, but shrugged it off. She decided to finish up the stream by playing Uno with a few of her fans. But when the sun dipped down and the moon rose up high in the night sky, she bid her fans goodbye, and that she would see them as soon as she could on the road. She shut down her computer, and with the wine weighing heavily on her mind, she managed to stumble into her bed without too much fuss or banging of toes. As she curled in on the soft arms of her blankets, she groggily did the mental math. While she could get a storage unit, it would be far easier to just use her apartment as a storage unit at this point. Her gun safes were here as well, bolted into the ground floor concrete, and the building was getting more and more upscale the further the rent went up. She reckoned that she had enough money set aside for at least two months of rent, and anything she found during her outings would probably cover what her donations didn't. While the wine lulled her to sleep, she thought of magical rings and glowing necklaces, sparkling armors and glinting fey daggers, and did her best not to think of the beings that crawled and lurked in dark places. The next morning, she awoke with a start and rustled to turn over and see what time was on her alarm clock. When she saw it was 7 a.m., she almost panicked in her rush to get out of bed. Before, she remembered that she had quit the day before, after telling Tim he had the breasts of a centaur. Ah, crap. She groaned and rubbed at her eyes with her left hand. She would get that giant idiot a card or something with a gift card in it to make up for her being mean to him. As she swung her legs over the side of the bed, she mused that it wasn't his fault that he was having to wrangle a cat herd of dropouts and college freshmen, and he probably hated every second of managing them. 
She reached up towards the ceiling and rolled her shoulders, trying to work the blood around, and thought he would probably like a gift card to Tiny Bubbles, the liquor store in Casper that had a pretty good selection of whiskeys. She got up and away from the warm arms of her bed and began to do her morning routine. Brush her teeth, floss, clean the sleep crud out of her eyeballs, check the vents for any stray brownies that may have fallen down the AC system again, get the coffee maker going, and then finally decide on what she was going to wear today. While slipping on a pair of 5.1 Tactilite pants, she thought about the stuff she needed to grab for her trip. She figured she would find a use for the old cruising trailer that had come with her motorbike when she bought it, and now she was kind of grateful it was sitting down in the parking lot storage area and not rotting in the dump. A tent was in order, unless she wanted to sleep under the stars. It was a romantic thought, until she remembered that it rained a lot and being exposed to the elements had its own problems, such as bugs crawling up your nose or snakes snuggling inside your sleeping bag with you. That sounds incredibly unpleasant. Wagner started carrying camping supplies due to the demand, kind of making them a one-stop shop for rookie treasure drivers. So she figured that she would start while picking up some extra ammunition. Speaking with the building manager went smoother than she expected and only had to pay a month in advance in case she was late getting back. When it came to her possessions, Emily told the manager just to call her folks down in New Mexico and they would figure it out. While Emily was not on constant speaking terms with her parents, she knew they wouldn't mind selling off all her stuff as some form of revenge. Emily walked out to her Honda Shadow and straddled the seat, rolling her helmet around as she remembered the huge fight that caused her to move away in the first place. Her mother was always constantly pushing her to pack up all her things and move to California, slugging it out with the other aspiring actors while struggling to pay the bills. Emily had been taken in by the glamour of it all during college, but when the fantasy was blown away by the crushing reality of having wasted two years in college learning nothing valuable, Emily and her mother clashed like a pair of mountain lions over a deer carcass. Her mother wanted her to keep on track of becoming a famous actor, while Emily just wanted to do something that actually made money without having to sell your soul. Acting on the stage was fun and all, but her only money-making skill was making lattes and cappuccinos. She pulled the helmet down around her face and tipped the visor up slightly so she could still get some fresh air in, and kicked the stand back with her heel. When the fight came to the big finale, Emily had stormed out of her family's ranch home and fled her mother's constant helicoptering, fleeing as far north as she could afford. Her mother was angry at Emily, throwing away such a promising career. While her father was furious, he paid for all of her college expenses just for it to end up as a giant nothing burger. Since then, she only spoke to them via email or letter during the holidays, and the peace has been kept that way. Emily had the last laugh, however, as Hollywood was now mostly oceanfront property, the water butting up against the letter-marked mountains. Driving was a bit congested this time in the morning, and Emily had a time of weaving in and out of the motorized and non-motorized foot traffic. There had always been stories of how weird humans were and speculation of how humanity would react when coming face-to-face -face with creatures of intelligence. <laughs> with... Other creatures of intelligence. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, humans can be smart too. <laughs> Uh, and to say the least, humans didn't disappoint. drive through car washes now offered scale scrubbing services for dragonkin. Traffic- oh dear. Dragonkin. Let's just say dragons. <laughs> dragonkin. Heaven help us all. I'm gonna assume that he meant real dragons and not- People who think they're dragons, because that would be a very interesting thing to see in a car wash. Anyway, traffic lights and signs were raised higher to allow for Goliaths to have an easier time walking around, and most car companies were including booster seats for drivers that lacked a foot or two in height. Any and all were welcomed with open arms to come and play with humanity, and it was certainly an interesting time to live in. Emily throttled back and honked her horn as a lung dragon sped past her and was not managing his tail as properly as it could be. Sorry, he called out with a mild Canadian accent. <laughs> Not entirely unexpected, but it was a little surprising. <laughs> and Emily watched his tail curl around her and out of the way of her motorcycle tires. She gave a little wave and clicked the transmission down into a lower gear so he could get back up to speed, and looked curiously at what the lung dragon was hauling today. Judging from the color of his back satchel, it seemed that he had been hired to haul something for Drag X, the new branch of FedEx that specialized in dragon-based transport. Well, that's definitely not what I thought of. 
Costs were high for the delivery since dragons requested higher pay for their services, but it allowed for smaller cargo loads to be transported faster than the truckers could manage. Emily leaned to the right and sped past a dwarf driving an old Chevy pickup that spat blue smoke out of his exhaust. He was going exactly the speed limit, which was something that drove Emily crazy. Dwarves stuck to the laws of whatever it was they were doing almost religiously, and at times it really made her want to pull her hair out. Eventually, she came up to the last stoplight before Wagner's, which was sitting ahead on the corner. Corner. She rolled to a halt, waiting for the light. A micro sprite landed on her center display console, huffing and puffing, and Emily opened her visor, leaning down so she could hear the little thing. The micro sprite stood and gripped the rim of her visor window, leaning into the helmet so she could be heard over the rumble of the Honda Shadow's engine. Could I ride with you across the street? The wind is hell today! Emily giggled and nodded, opening a pocket on her leather jacket so the micro sprite could hop in. The light turned green and Emily clicked the shifter into first gear, setting herself rumbling across the intersection and down the street towards Wagner's. She made a quick detour to drop the micro pixie off at the stereo store she worked at, but spun back around to get the supplies she needed. Thankfully, Wagner's was empty and she was able to grab a pretty good one-person tent and some spare ammunition, just in case she needed it. The drive back to her apartment was less eventful, only having to change lanes once because a tree troll had broken his toe on the lip of a sewer lid. It felt extremely odd pecking away like she was. The motorcycle's trailer could hold quite a bit of stuff, and Emily had no problems tucking away multiple rifles, a few pistols, loaded magazines, boxes of ammunition, Canadian IMPs and MREs, bottles of water, clothes, toiletries. It felt more like she was panking for a camping trip rather than a new job where it was a 50-50 chance of coming out with your pockets lined with money or dead. As she closed the trunk of the little trailer, she felt sudden reservations about leaving the coffee shop, but after telling Tim he had breasts equivalent to a female centaur, it was a solid bed that she would have to lay in the bed she made. She tucked a few more things into her saddlebags, and after wiping away a few beads of sweat from her forehead, she was ready to be off and on the road. For the most part, she had taken very little from her apartment, but that wasn't exactly a shocker since it would be hard to haul a sofa on the back of her motorcycle. She decided on a shoulder rig for the ride out, tucking a CZ-75 into the holster and then zipping her riding jacket back up. She checked the safes, making sure they were closed and the tumblers spun, and spent some time double and triple checking her door lock, until even her key was starting to doubt itself. With one final check of her gear, she got back on the motorbike and turned the engine over. Emily felt excited for the first time in years, and her mind constantly spun with thoughts on what she could find and what she would do when she found her first big ticket item, and just what kind of people she would meet along the way. She clicked the motorbike into first and rumbled out of the parking lot, the rear of her bike bouncing a little under the weight of the trailer. Now that Emily thought about it, there weren't many, if any, female treasure divers. She knew of maybe one down on the remains of Florida, but a lot of people weren't sure if she herself was not part alligator or something, if not just a myth in herself. She did, however, know of the male divers, and the majority of them were rough customers for sure. Ex-military veterans, contract mercenaries, ex-cons with nothing to lose. You could find all a manner of rough and tumble people running around near the saltwater wastes nowadays. Emily, for all she knew, could be the first female treasure diver to make it big. Or be the first one chewed apart and eaten. There was always that chance, after all. It was kind of funny because it seemed like only humans and a few choices of fey folk made attempts at treasure diving. A lot of the interdimensional beings couldn't stand even getting near the places where the shadow beings lived. Others being so delicate of mind that just smelling the beast could cause them to detonate with magical energies. Humans by far were the most resilient of the bunch, something that confused a lot of the other creatures that now inhabited Terra. Emily always heard about how odd humans were, from the things they ate to how they treated one another. Even more odd was how they could stare into the many faces of the shadow abominations and not even feel a single tingle of insanity in their brain. Yes, they still felt pants wetting fear, but there was something about humans that they could just not understand or figure out. Humans in general just shrugged when they were asked, stating that sometimes that's just how it is. The expert adaptability of humans made them quickly beloved by any race or creature they came across, and it was considered cool by the Fae and Extraordinary to have at least one human they could call a true friend. Emily didn't really have any true friends, as she mostly kept to herself and was too busy working most of the time. It's not that she didn't want any friends, it's just that she rarely had time to actually hang out and do the whole friends activities thing. As she turned up onto the highway and swung around a group of centaurs out for a jog, she did wonder if she could finally have time to meet some friends. There would be downtime for sure, and perhaps she could find a way to wiggle her way into someone's book of buddies and acquaintances. 
It would definitely help with the whole crushing loneliness thing, as her fanbase only really counted as a way to make money after all, and any of them that wanted to be her friend really only wanted something else entirely. She had been around long enough to know how that game worked, and she had no want or need to play. Out on the highway, traffic was light, the wind was sweet and clean, and Emily cracked her visor a smidge to really get the air flowing. She felt lighter in some ways, finally breaking away from the stagnation that had been weighing her down. Was this decision a bit rash? Well, yes it was, as it was fueled by anger and the frustration of constantly getting screwed over at work. Should she have just found another job? Well, yeah, she probably should have. She passed several for hire signs on the way to the highway and... No, no, she was going to do things her way for once. She was going to do what she wanted to do. Hell or high salt water. She wanted real fame, real money, not just minor notoriety on the internet just as a chick who really liked guns. She wanted to hold power, find the unfindable, make friends in high places that had power themselves. She wanted to finally live. Not just stagnate away in some low-level job while struggling to entertain people over a stream. Emily rotated her throttle back and really let the engine open up. The V2 engine roaring past a semi-truck. Whoever it was that left the address in the donation text was challenging her. She just knew it. And she wanted to meet the challenge head on. Not her mother telling her to because she thought she was perfect for it. Not her father pressuring her to because he had paid for it. But because she wanted it. To take the challenge and become something in this rapidly changing world. Emily was going to be somebody. Or die trying. End of chapter one. And that's the end of this chapter of Emily Bronze, The Sins of Another. If you like the story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Garbeardia, as well as stop by Neckbeardia for more D&D green texty goodness. Now if you like the story and want to donate to keep the story going, be sure to mark it on the copy as for Emily Bronze. That way Miss Bedlam gets her cut of the cash and cheddar, you know what I mean? <laughs> This is her first uh, paid narration, so hopefully we can keep this train rolling for Emily Bronze and give her a bit of the recognition she deserves, I'd reckon. I think, uh, I think she deserves it. Her voice is definitely something else. But until we see you next time on this side of the veil, this has been Garbeardia.